Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. Our topic today specifically is learning wisdom for witnessing from Jesus. You can't beat a better topic than that. Learning wisdom for witnessing from Jesus. Nobody in history has been more successful in witnessing to other people than Jesus Christ. I don't think that we should expect anything less. After all, he is God in the flesh. And the number one problem we have today is that the church has been failing miserably in the assignment to go into all the world and preach the gospel. There are more sinners on the earth today than there was 2,000 years ago when the church was formed. Which means that the church has not been as successful as the birth rate has been in producing sinners. In other words, if the church had been effective, there should have been less sinners on the earth 2,000 years after the death of Christ than there should have been before. That also means then that the birth rate has been more effective and faster than the rebirth rate. Does that make sense? In other words, being born has been not under the influence of being born again. And so more people are being born than are being born again. Because the folks who are born again don't know how to reach the folks who are just being born. It should therefore not surprise us that even though we celebrate the year 2000, this could be an incrimination on the church. Many people are celebrating the year 2000 on the Y2K spirit. My heart is not as much celebration. I am really more in a reality concerned. In a way, I'm a little ashamed to celebrate 2000. Because if 2000 years has passed and we still haven't reached the world that was smaller at that time and now bigger, then it means that something's wrong with what we're doing or we are not effective as we should be. Let me suggest to you that God does not fail. That means that if, if there's failure, then it's not in God, it's in us. There's something that we're not doing correctly. Jesus came to earth and he was the only person like himself on the planet. Listen very carefully to this, please. There was no other person on the earth who was filled with the Holy Spirit walking the planet when Jesus came. He was the only person who was completely in fellowship and in harmony with God. There was no other specimen on the planet. And yet his goal was to bring every human into that relationship to become just like he was. He did a great job. In three and a half years, he created a ministry, a company, an organization, or an agency, if you may, that became a worldwide ministry. He did that in three and a half years. 2,000 years later, we are not any more effective, proportionately speaking, than he was in those three and a half years on earth. Which means that we did not keep up with his system or his style of influence. He was able to influence the world in three and a half years more than we were able to influence the world in 2000 years afterwards i think therefore it is to our benefit to study jesus and find out what did he do that made him so effective in witnessing or impacting his world and his generation let me make a few statements then to prepare us for the study of jesus it is a fact and truth that no one knows a product like the manufacturer. 
I think we all agree with that. No one knows the purpose of a product like the one who made it. And the number one desire and the deepest craving in the heart of the product called man or humanity is the desire to discover meaning and significance for his life. Every one of you in this auditorium and watching this television program, I know what your number one desire is. I know what it is. Everyone has the same desire. And that desire is to discover the reason for your existence. You want to know that there is a significance to your life on earth. Everybody is trying to find out why they were born. Every man is motivated and everything he does is motivated by this craving. That is the need to feel important and significant. The most important desire on the heart of God, on the other hand, is to see every human discover this significance and their purpose and passion for life. God wants you to find out why you were born more than you want to find out why you were born. After all, he's the manufacturer and you are the product. He knows exactly why he created you and that's why he's going after you. God wants to find you more than you want to find God. I think it's important to note that every human being is actually looking for God. They don't know where to find him or how to find him most of the time, but they're seeking God. They know there's somebody who knows why they exist. God created man and is the only one who can satisfy this critical need in man. Only the manufacturer knows how to meet the needs of his product. The fall of man was a fall from God's will, a fall from God's purpose, and a fall from his fulfillment. In other words, a man, male and female, will never be fulfilled until they find out God's original purpose for their lives. The void, therefore, that is in the human spirit is the need for the Spirit of God. Because when man failed, he lost God's spirit, therefore he lost contact with the manufacturer, and therefore humans are simply products trying to find their purpose. And only the manufacturer knows that purpose. I like what it says in the book of Corinthians. It says, as the body is for food and food for the stomach, even so man was made for God and God for man. It's a powerful statement. The same way your stomach needs food and food fits your stomach, the Bible says the same way man was made for God and God was made for man. In other words, when God designed you, he designed you to function on him the same way your food allows your body to function. Without food, you'll die. Without God, you will die. The two go together. So you were made for God, and God designed your body for Him. No wonder why the Bible says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, what is God's response when man fell? Write this down. The response of God to the fall of man was a promise. It's found in Genesis 2, chapter 3, rather, verse 15. God's response was what? A promise. Say it with me, a promise. Say it again, a promise. I want to read the promise to you, please. In these next few moments, I want you to capture this promise. It's found in Genesis 3, verse 15. Here's what it says. And God said unto Satan, The woman that you have beguiled she shall have a seed and this seed shall crush your head and you will bruise his heel and I will put enmity between you and the seed of the woman and between you and the woman now that's the promise God made this is very important to the the next generation of church people why God is saying I'm gonna solve the problem of humanity in a way that will work and here's the way I'm gonna have a seed enter the human race and that seed will be successful in destroying the works of the devil and he will reestablish the authority that man lost a promise to restore man back to his original position and dominion over the earth was God's intent every human is on God's mind the story of the prodigal son is a story of the will of God for man and if you will notice, and I want to set this up quickly, 
When Jesus was talking about how God feels about humans, he used this story about the prodigal son. Listen to the story. He said a father had sons. Everybody say sons. He didn't have servants, he had sons. And one of the sons left the house on his own and turned his back on the family. That son went out and destroyed his life. He messed up his future and he lost his great inheritance. The story goes that he discovered himself among pigs and then he came to himself and said, I will go back home. And when he came back, he didn't ask to be reinstated as a son. His attitude was so poor. His self-esteem was so low that he began to think like a pig. And so he said, I will go back and ask my father to make me a hired servant. Now isn't this amazing? He left the son but came out with a slave mentality. And that's exactly what is happening to the millions, yea, even the billions watching this program around the world and even in our own country here in the Bahamas. We are sons of God acting like slaves and even when we come back to God, we still think like slaves. I love the fact that the father refused to accept his proposition. The young man said, I want to be a servant. The father says, my son, who was once lost, is now found. By the way, I think when you talk about witnessing effectively, it isn't the son who left that has a problem witnessing. It's the one that stayed home. The one that stayed home represents the church for the most part. Because that's the one who don't want the dirty sinners to come home. That's the one who gets jealous when God saves someone who was real bad and they start doing better than he who was always in the house. That's the one who becomes angry because God seemed to put more love on the sinner than he does on the saint in the house. We got a problem in the house. As a matter of fact, have you ever asked yourself a question? How come the son in the pig pen had to come to himself? Selah. How come his elder brother didn't go to him and tell him to come back home? He never thought about it. Here is your brother. You know he's in the pig pen. You know he's out there squandering his life. And yet you are so happy to be at home eating calf meat and wearing fine robes and handling a nice ring of authority and shoes of silver and you don't care about your brother that big son the elder one at home needs a good beating sounds like the church who cares if people are in the pig pen but they are your brother their family no wonder why the father rebuked the one who was home and said what's wrong with your attitude why aren't you happy, he says. My son, who was once lost, has come home. Aren't you happy? And then he told the servants to kill the fatted calf. His eldest son should have killed that fatted calf. It's amazing that when you become so used to being in the house of God, you believe that there's no one else that should be there. That story is an important story. But here's the best part of the story. The son that came home was the son that left. Here's the good news. Every person who does not know Christ personally today is a son of God. They are lost. They are out of touch. They are seeking for him. They are starving for him. But they cannot find their way back home. And what does he do? He wants to send the kids in the house to the pig pen. That's called witnessing. God's promise was to come into the human race and redeem us back to him. Was that his promise? I want you to write that promise down please. God's promise was to come into the human race and redeem us back to himself. That was God's promise. Oh, hallelujah. God's promise was to come to earth and redeem us back to himself. 
O Lord, help us. God's promise was not to come to earth and take us to heaven. His promise was not to take us from earth and bring us to heaven. His promise was to leave heaven and come to earth and redeem us back to himself. That was the promise. Therefore, this promise developed a program. Write the program down. It's called salvation. Salvation is God's program to redeem you back to him. The word salvation is from the word to salvage, which means to restore something to its original state. Therefore, God's plan for mankind is to restore mankind back to its original state. Every human in this building, young and old, and watching this program somewhere in your house or your apartment or your hotel room or in prison or in hospital, you know in your heart that you are seeking power. Selah. Let me say something to you, my friends. People are not looking for Calvary. I want you to get this message. The sinner is not looking for Calvary. He's not looking for the resurrection. He's not looking for the thorns and the nails in the hands of a great savior. The sinner is looking for one thing, power. Uh, let me disappoint you again. You also are looking for power. You don't want me to prove it now, do you? Everybody in this room, including me, we are looking for power. We're not looking for worship. We're looking for power. And the question is, how do you know that? Because that's what you lost. Why does a person dream of being a millionaire at 40? Let me tell you why. Power. They want the power to buy what they want, live where they want, drive what they want, eat what they want, marry who they want, go where they want without restriction. In other words, they want the thing that would give them the power to do these things. So it's not really money you want. It's the power that money gives you. That's what you want. We are seeking power because that's what God gave us. God gave us dominion. And we lost dominion. So we're seeking for dominion. And the only person that could restore that dominion is the manufacturer. That is why you get sick when you are dominated by the banks or by someone you owe. You get sick when you cannot pay your bills. Why? Because you are being dominated instead of dominating. And so your whole life goes into schisms and into short circuits because you are living in the environment you're not built for. How did you feel when you paid your last bill off? What happens when you pay a bill off? Your whole life takes on a different pride. You almost feel like you run the world until your next bill shows up. How am I doing? See, we, I know you hate to hear that, but that's true. We are really seeking power. That's why we want to mix with certain people because they got power. We want to associate with certain organizations because they got a sense of power. We even wear certain clothing with certain symbols on it because it gives a sense of importance and power. It's all motivated by this need to be restored back to the dominion spirit of God. That is why the will of God is to salvage you and to restore you back to the original state that you fell from, which is the state of dominion. If you notice then that the message of Jesus was not a message of Calvary. And please don't turn the TV off yet. Every word I'm saying, I'm, cautious, I'm cautiously weighing it because you see, I'm not speaking from a Bible school study that I did in three years. I'm speaking from 31 years of walking with the Lord. And I've come to conclusions after I read the Bible 28 times now. I've come to conclusion that Jesus came with a message that most of the world missed. Especially the church. Christ never spoke to the multitudes about Calvary. He never told them about him dying. 
he reserved that for the private meeting with his disciples. So what was the message to the world? What did he know they wanted to hear? He preached this message that was weird to us, and we don't hear it too much in the church. As a matter of fact, when you go to the church people, they keep talking about blood, and about Calvary, and about hell, and about resurrection, and about demons, and all this stuff. Christ never preached that stuff to the multitudes. He, pro he preached this message that was weird. He preached a power message. He stood before them and he would say things like, There is a king dominion. And you can become a part, once again, of the king rulership, dominion, power, kingdom. And his message was, you can join the power group. You can become a part of the power group. You can rule in life again. That was his message. The people loved it. They followed him everywhere he went. He would talk to people who were victims of their lust, like prostitutes, and he would say, you can go and sin no more. There's power available for you to overcome the stuff that's overcoming you. He would talk to fishermen who were victims of empty nets and say, look, you, cannot, you can change the way you live if you join this kingdom rulership power organization called the kingdom of God, and you can have authority over fish. And then he gave them an example. He caught fish just by sitting in the boat. No wonder why they dropped their nest. They were looking for power. Oh boy. I'll connect with those who are listening. You see, the disciples dropped their nets not because they liked this rabbi. Come on, talk to me. Here's a man. These are businessmen. They own their business. They got money to make. They got business things to do. They are in charge of Zebedee Fishing International Company. This man meets them, and then one day, they leave their company. You don't do that unless someone promises you something better than your company. They saw power. As a matter of fact, when the fish came in the boat and the nets began to break, what did Peter do? You know, Peter's a guy hungry for power. Peter's never seen power like this before. The Bible says he fell on his face in that boat and he says, get away from me. I'm not deserving to be in your presence. I've never seen power like this before. And Jesus says, get up, man. You ain't seen nothing yet. From now on, you have the ability to power and influence men. Peter says, I like this deal. Come on. I like this. This is a good deal. I get to have that kind of power, yep, over fish, yep, then I'm going to follow you. Why? Because God wants to restore all people back to where they fell from. And it's authority over life, victory over life. That's what you were born to do. Oh, y'all hear me. You were not born to be a victim of marijuana leaves and, and tobacco leaves and, and grape juice that makes you drunk. You're supposed to rule these things, not them rule you. Imagine people with muscles and brains being enslaved by a leaf from Colombia. Something's wrong with that dominion. Imagine people who wear nice suits and fine clothing and walk around in briefcases, but they are victims of a grape juice that makes them drink it because they have to. Imagine grapes running your life and you call yourself a man. You ever wonder why God was so concerned about money? Money is, is a piece of tree. You don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't take dope. Ah, but there's a piece of paper in your pocket. And that tree runs your life, doesn't it? Yes, you kill for this, you will sell your, your, your ethics for this, you sacrifice your morals for this. People do all kinds of stuff for this piece of tree. Why? They are controlled by the leaf and by the bark of a tree. We were not born to be controlled, we were born to control. Thank you very much for that hand, I appreciate that. I want you to turn to Isaiah 7 verse 14 quickly please. I want you to see what God did. Now God designed salvation to restore the original state of man. Everybody say salvation. Say it loud for the TV audience. Salvation. One more time. Salvation. Give the Lord a big hand for salvation. I thank God for salvation. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank God for salvation. Salvation is the word for wholeness in Hebrew. Now, God made the promise in Genesis 3.15. He established it and then he began to explain it in Isaiah. Look at verse 14. 
the virgin will bear a son and his name shall be called what Emmanuel which means what God with us look at chapter 9 verse 6 for unto us a child is born and unto us what a son is given his name shall be called wonderful counselor mighty God everlasting father Prince of Peace and upon his shoulders there shall be the government and to the end of his kingdom there shall be no end what a passage I want you to learn something here look at me look 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 look, look at me God says I'm gonna save those creatures down there listen to me now I'm talking about witnessing like Jesus don't miss the principle I gotta fix that world the only problem is they are humans and I am spirit they are visible and I am invisible they are man and I am God but I want to reach them I want to salvage them I want to redeem them I want to restore them I want to save them I want to see them come back to their grace and to their power he says now I'm up here and they down there I am God and they are man I am spirit and they are human I'm in heaven and they on earth but I want to redeem them I got a problem I'm here they're there I'm this they're that but I got to redeem them what does he do the Bible says a virgin shall bear a child and his name shall be called God that's up here in man that's down there are you telling me that God is going to leave where he is and go where they are are you telling me that God is going to stop being who he is and become what they are Come on, get the message. Witnessing began in Genesis 3.15. And in Isaiah, God reminds us in detail how it works. He says, look, to reach them, you got to go where they are and become like them. You'll get it after I'm gone, I'm sure. You don't stand where you are and tell them, come. Y'all better hear this message. If you're going to reach the world in politics, in business, in music, in entertainment, in sports, in whatever it is, you don't stand in the church door and tell them, come friends. You got to go where they are and put on what they got on. Oh, I'm going to preach to myself anyhow. Christ did not say to us, you must become like me before I mix with you. That's church talk. That ain't Christ talk. Come on, I want you to go deep now. We're in the Old Testament. He says, look, he says, for me to fix this thing, I cannot stay where I am. For me to redeem this thing, I cannot stay who I am. Oh God, teach me how to do this. God's program required the entrance into our world. Everybody say our world. Say it again, our world. What is our world? The world of man. It was Christ who said at the end of his ministry in John 21, he says, therefore as the Father sent me, so send I you. So study how the Father sent me. That's how you're supposed to go. How the Father sent me? He didn't send me as spirit. He made me just like you guys. Now will you please be like them other people I'm sending you to? We can't do it. The world is not worn today because we are too spiritual. The 21st century church got to be a different kind of church. Matter of fact, the Lord is about to do it. I'm so happy. You know, some folk, oh, help me, Jesus. Let me tell you something. The 20th century church went after gifts. We're still suffering from it today. Everybody wants speaking in tongues, want to have miracles, want to have healing. Want... But the 21st century church is going to go after fruit. We're going to go after self-discipline, goodness, kindness long-suffering patience with people
Let me ask you a question. Is God smarter than you? I can't hear you. I want you to confess this. Say it. God is smarter than I. One more time. God is smarter than I. Now, do you believe that? Are you sure? Uh, I want you to... This is a very serious question. If God is smarter than you, then that means God knows what works better than you do. Think about what I'm saying now. Which means you cannot improve on God's program. Write that down somewhere. See, we still think we're better than God. If you want to know how to do something right, study God. After all, He's God. No one can beat Him, right? I mean, He knows how to make everything successful. He is God. He's the ultimate. So if you want to make sure you succeed, study God's style. Study God's program. Study God's ways. Study God's system and you'll be successful. Are you with me? Follow this now. Therefore, <laughs> this is great. Oh, this is so great. Hallelujah. <laughs> Help us, Lord. Look, God has a big world with a lot of people on it, and He wants to change that world. You got a big world, and you're supposed to change that world too. The world of technical work, where you work, electronics. That's the world. You work in education. That's the world. That's a big. You say, God, there are 10,000 teachers in the system, and I'm supposed to get them all born again and in salvation. That's a big world. God's had the same problem too. You only get that little world. I had the whole world. And I had nobody, just me. And I wanted all of them to be saved. So follow my style. What did I do? How did I set it up? He said, first of all, I didn't remain where I am. Y'all didn't get me. You don't stay in church pews. And you don't stay in your little spiritual world. Follow his style. He knows how to reach the world better than you know how to reach the world. And then he says, now follow me. I'll show you how to reach the world. There's no better program than what God has planned. You cannot improve on what God established. God concluded, listen to this, therefore, that the most effective way to win man was to become like him. Oh dear. Oh dear. Oh my God. That is too simple. Still ain't there yet, okay. God says, look, here's how you convert an entire planet. Don't tell them to become like you. You become like them. Now I'm going to say something very important here, very important here. Listen to me carefully. He said, the best way to win them is to identify with them. I'm talking about business men, plumbers, electricians, nurses, policemen, doctors, lawyers, housewives, youth, politicians, educators, business people, economists, ambassadors. He said, look, all of those are different worlds. If you're going to win them, you have to become like them and identify with them. God's call to man was for man to return to his position of power and dominion. But he had to go to that man's world and preach that gospel to the man. What was the wisdom of Jesus in witnessing to mankind so effectively? He became like man. I want to read just a few more scriptures and then we're going to close. Please turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. On the way there, stop off to John chapter 1, please. Thank you, Lord. Everybody say, discipling every discipline. 
as God's will for us. John chapter 1 is the greatest witnessing tool program. Everybody has it? John chapter 1, verse 1. Let's read it out loud. In the beginning was the Word. Come on together. And the Word was God. And the Word was with God. And the same was in the beginning with God. Now, what does that talk about? God. Who's God? The Word. So it's talking about God. Please read verse 14 out loud. And the Word became flesh and dwelled among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten Son of the Father. All right. All right. All right. You want, you want to hear some revelation? Watch this. This is revelation. First of all, He says, I'm God, they're man. That's verse 1. Verse 14 says, Now I'm man. <laughs> What's he doing? He's getting ready to change the whole world. He doesn't remain God. The God became what? Flesh. Why? Because the people he's trying to reach are dressed in a flesh suit. This is going to be the biggest revelation you ever had about witnessing. It's coming right now. Listen to me carefully. This is where the church has really been making a mistake. Read what it says after he put on the flesh. Read it, read it, read it. And we beheld his glory. Now this is the revelation to me. It didn't say, and we beheld his clothing. It didn't say we beheld his haircut. This is very important. Don't miss this. It didn't say the people saw the kind of shoes he had on. Don't miss this. Because this is where the church is messed up. This is God. But now he has on human flesh. And he doesn't show the things we consider to be distinctions. Write the word glory down. You ain't got it yet. Write the word glory down. We beheld this what? Glory. Everybody say glory. Say it loud. Come on for the TV audience. Say it loud. Glory. Come on. Say it loud for our friends around the world. Glory. Lift your right hand. Say glory. Glory. Hard. Say glory. Glory. What did they, what did they beheld? His glory. glory. I can't hear. What did they beheld? His, the word beheld means to observe. They were able to look at this, this man and they were able to see the glory of God. This is important. We keep trying to show the people the clothes of God, the hairstyle of God. The handkerchief of God, the Bible of God, the shoes of God, the lips of God. That's why you believe you got to dress differently from them. Because you believe God dresses a certain way. And it has nothing to do with clothing. Oh, hear this message. You know what the word glory means? Write it down. It means nature. Ah, here we go in witnessing now. It has to do with what? Your nature. The people saw the nature of God in his life. That means the principles of God. The attitude of God, the response of God, they saw the kindness of God, the understanding of God, the patience of God, the kindness of God, the tolerance of God. They saw stuff that ain't had no clothes on it. Are you getting the message? He became flesh. 
and dwelt among us, looked just like us, but the distinction was his nature. God, you see, you, oh, Lord, help me. You got, hmm, ah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, ooh. People come to me and say, Pastor Miles, I work in a hotel. And I am a Christian. And they want me to work in the, in the casino. They want me to work in the club. They want me to serve alcoholic drinks. What should I do as a Christian? No, you got a, you got a problem. That's a serious question. You in a casino? You serving alcohol in a, in, in a restaurant? Now the question comes, what should you do? Oh, you could be glad you're in this session today. Because you see, the first quick response of the church is, leave now, child. Leave, child. That, that ain't God. God ain't going that, that, That's the devil's den, the den of demons. <laughs> well, let me ask you a question, my dear. Where do you think God came when he left heaven, put on his earthly suit, and came down? Where do you think he was? In the den of y'all people. What were you doing when he arrived? Drinking, cussing, smoking, dancing, grooving, shacking up, sniffing coke, and he came right in the middle of you. Who do you think you are, you self-righteous person? Do you know what your problem is? I ain't talking to you, you're talking to everybody else. Let me tell you what your problem is. Your problem is you want to work in a Christian company with Christian workers, with a Christian typewriter, with a Christian computer, with a Christian dumb, with a Christian... You stupid people! Take that job at the casino. What a great place to shine. Hallelujah. Go ahead and take that job in the club. Mm -hmm. If they want Dubonet, bring it to them with a smile. And they say, what are you smiling about? Don't drink this. <laughs> Come on, praise the Lord, somebody. I say praise the Lord. Every man got a right to do what he wants to do. Let your nature be the witness. Not your avoidance. Amen. You know, I'm so glad that in our country, you know, so far the policy in casinos is here that no local person could get involved in gambling. I, I think that's a pretty good deal. I'm not sure how long that can last. I may change before I die. I don't know. But I think it's pretty good. I think that's a setup from God. Because the folks who got all that money looking for, for a good time. So God put you right at the crap table, full of the Holy Ghost, dealing cards. Yes, sir. Yes. Go ahead and deal them cards. And they say, why are you so happy? I ain't got to do what you all doing to be happy. Where do you put your money? In the kingdom of God. Give them the cards. Then they say, after we finish this game, I want to talk to you, okay? They beheld his what? His glory. There's supposed to be a difference between you and the other electricians, brother. Let me read something to you that will mesmerize you. Turn to Malachi and take a deep breath. Oh, glory, hallelujah. Malachi, last book in the Old Testament, right after the blank page. <laughs> chapter 3 get your pen you want to underline this stuff watch God go to work now in this if you're not sure that conferences are from God I'm gonna now show you where God encourages us to have conferences it's found in verse 16 this is the first conference in the Bible <laughs> then those who feared the Lord 
met together and talked to each other. That's a conference. And the Lord listened and heard what they were saying. That means they're making decisions in the conference. God heard it. Then they wrote it down. Write down what you decide in the conference. That's what we're going to be doing coming up here in August. That's what we're doing here in this meeting today. We are discussing God's issues and then we're going to write it down. What are we going to decide to do? God says, I heard you. Now write down what you got to do. Now watch this stuff. And they wrote it down in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. They will be mine, says the Lord Almighty. In the day when I make up my treasured possessions, I will spare them just as in the compassion a man spares his son who serves him. That's salvation. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked. Because those who serve God, between those who serve God and those who do not. Write that down. He said it ain't about dress. It's about the distinction of natures. Everybody say witnessing like Jesus. Do you know who was Jesus' best friends? I'm going to show you right now from the Bible. His best friends, not who you think it was. It wasn't Caiaphas the high priest. <laughs> Philippians 2. Quick, quick, quick. Philippians 2. Glory, hallelujah. Philippians 2. Everybody say become like them. To win them. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. Let your attitude. Everybody say attitude. Say it loud. I can't hear you. Come on. I want you all to be smarter than the other Christians. The King James says mind. The word there in the original text is attitude or mindset. Read it. Let the same attitude which was in Christ be in you. What was his attitude? What's the attitude? Who being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be maintained. Wow. But made himself nothing. No reputation. That's your problem, trying to keep your reputation. I can't be seen with them, child. They can mess up my reputation. God says, go with them and lose your reputation. Y'all didn't hear what he said just now. I said, you didn't read the Bible just now. He said, I am God. I was God from the beginning. I am God. I like being God, but I got to save these people. So I ain't going to hang on to being God, because I can't save them, I still hang on to being God. Did you read that? He is God, but he says, I cannot hang on to being God and save them too. In order to save someone, you got to become like them, he says. And to become like them, you may lose your reputation. Let me tell you, in the 21st century, I want to see a lot of y'all lose your reputation. What reputation? Being self-righteous. Better than other people. Think you're better and holier than other people. Lose that reputation. Let it be seen the way his reputation was. They said he had a reputation that the, the religious people didn't like. The religious people hated his reputation. He had his reputation. He is the son of, he's the friend of sinners. How about that reputation? Sinners like this person. How's that for a reputation? They like to be around you. Wow. Right now they don't like you, right? When you show up, they leave. They scatter. Here she comes. Here he comes. Oh boy, here he comes. He's going to tell us about you. Oh God, here we go again. And they run from you. And yet when you read Jesus' life, they ran to him. The sinners, it's the religious people who ran from him. Something ain't right about this. Read on. It says, being in the form of God, he didn't consider something to be held on to, but made himself what? Of no reputation. Taking on the very name.
servant being made in human likeness being found in appearance of a man he humbled himself everybody say you got to become to bring transformation the last thing we need right now is another pastor the pulpits are causing trouble please stay out of the pulpit we need some doctors and some mechanics and some plumbers and some media people and some and some lawyers and some we need people go in where you were born to be make that your church he became like a man so he could win men that's the way God's program works he established that relationship you may ask now I want to close on this point because this is where we can pick up next week oh boy it's gonna be good next week but here's where the problem is <laughs> here's what you are gonna get oh I heard from God I know I heard from God you know what they're gonna to say to you when you start mixing with those people and you start becoming like them you know what they're gonna to say to you normal Christian response compromising you're compromising the gospel okay then when we identify with the world are we compromising if we are then Jesus is the greatest compromiser in history because he became like you he is God verse 5 but he became like a man verse 6 what are you gonna do with that that's compromise why didn't God say I'm God you men I'm holy you sinners come up to my level you'd have never been saved write this down never confuse compassion with compromise if you love your brother who is in the pig pen go get some mud on you and when you start calling love compromise something's wrong with your head to get your brother out of the mud in that pig pen you gotta get in the mud God had to put on flesh to reach flesh so that he could redeem us back to spirit this is the will of God and Luke 5 verse 30 says why do you eat with tax collectors and sinners they asked him his answer was I did not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance you self-righteous stiff-necked Pharisees Luke 7 verse 34 I come eating and drinking with sinners and you say I am a friend of a sinner and you are right he says for these they who are whole do not need a physician but only those who are sick <laughs> when Christmas comes and the time for the Christmas party please go and when they start discussing in the committee meeting should they have alcohol tell them if you wish as long as there's Kool-Aid and Coke and when you go to the party you take your glass, walk around the room like everybody else, with your little seven up in it. What you doing? Wheeling and dealing for the kingdom. See, some of y'all are too spiritual. I ain't going to that party. All they're going to do is drink and smoke. You are the light of the world. You don't change darkness by avoiding darkness. Oh boy, he's coming soon. 
after you finish doing your work. Close your Bible. Give the Lord a hand. Let's go home. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.